we'll, we'll get started. So um, welcome everyone to our session tonight, which is um, a special leadership council session called Everybody Has a Seat at the Table with our special guest, Yara. And I'll introduce her in a second. But just to get started, just to help Yara know who's in the Zoom room, could you all go ahead and put in the chat your name and where you go to school and the grade you're in? And also, as your challenge, um, if you could type in one word about how you feel about your, your body. Um, and that'll help Yara just get a sense of who's here and kind of what, what the general feels are right now about um, about our about body image. So go ahead and pop it in the chat, your name, school grade, and one word, adjective, or one feeling word that describes how you feel about your body. And welcome ladies, for those who just joined us, if you can please, please, please turn on your video cameras tonight, we would love it. I know it's been a long day, but we'd love to see your faces. And in the chat, if you if you can all go ahead and um, type in your name, grade, school, and one word or feeling about your body. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Jillian, go first. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the word. <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer. Hello, Nia. Hello. Is it Kyla or Keila? It's Kyla. Kyla? Jordan? Jordan? Jillian? Maya? Maya? Okay. I love some of these words. I love some of these words. Enough? Dedicated? And then we've got some honest words here too. Unsure, insecure. I love the honesty and authenticity. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Mm, hold on. One word about your body you don't like. Yeah, for those who just joined, um, you can turn on your if you can turn on your video camera, and then we're just introducing ourselves with our name, school grade, and one word that you feel about your body, just to get us started today. Awesome. So let me introduce the extraordinary, phenomenal guest speaker we have for you tonight. Her name is Yara Zegeb. How is that? <laughs> Do you want Okay. <laughs> Yara is amazing. She is a Fulbright scholar with a master's degree in security studies from Georgetown University, as well as a PhD in international affairs and diplomacy from a Paris university. She was born in Lebanon and is fluent in English, Arabic, French, and Spanish. She is the author of the amazing book, The Girls at 17 Swan Street. And she also has a forthcoming novel called No Land to Light On. And her writing has appeared virtually everywhere in the Huffington Post, the Four Seasons Magazine, Holiday, the European, WS Magazine, Home Magazine, The Idealist, and the list keeps going. Um, we're so thrilled and honored to have her here with you tonight. And the way this is going to work is first, Yara is just going to kind of open up and, and, and talk for a little bit about her background and, and what inspired her to write the book. And then Olivia West, um, the president of our High School Leadership Council, is going to moderate some Q&A. She's got a few questions planned out in advance, and then we're going to open it up to all of you. The session really is for you tonight. It's a safe space. It's a welcoming space. Um, I want you to feel comfortable and, and I'm hopeful that we can just have some real honest conversation about, uh, about body image. So with that, Yara, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Sherry. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I'm honored and I love the work that you do at Live Girl. And ladies, thank you for being here tonight. It, I'm, I'm looking forward to this evening with you. Um, and you were also wonderful sharing about how you feel about your body. Um, I, I need to contribute too. My name is Yara. I am 31 years old. I uh, don't go to school anymore. 
um, I um, I'm at home with two toddlers and a hobby and uh, I'm in Boston and how I feel about my body is oof, I like torn um, I'm looking at your chat I'm I think I feel I feel very torn tonight about my own body so there you go that's my input um, for tonight um, a little bit about myself um, well I wrote the book the girls at 17 Swan Street and for those of you who have not read it, um, it's, um, it's the story of a young girl's descent into anorexia and then her fight to recover and to recover her life. Her name is Anna. She's a ballet dancer. She's married to her best friend who's called Matthias. They live in France and then they move to the United States when Matthias is offered a job in St. Louis, Missouri and that is where the story happens uh anna develops anorexia and she gets admitted into treatment and i won't i won't tell you more about the story but i thought what i would do is um i could read a small excerpt from the book and then we could take it from there just to give you a sense of what the story is about so the story is divided into flashbacks and moments in the present tense Anna's the one telling the story. She's in a treatment center for eating disorders. For those of you who don't know, it's sort of like a hospital, but it's like a house on its own, like the, the house at 17 Swan Street, if you want. And the girls who are there, some of the centers have boys, but the one that Anna's in is only girls. Uh, they live there full time and they all have different eating disorders. Some of them have anorexia, nervosa, some have bulimia, and we can talk more about those and the different spectrum of eating disorders later on, if you like. But so they, they each have their own diseases and they're all there. In a way, they're hospitalized, uh, but they're in treatment for their, their diseases. And Anna is in that place and she's the one telling the story. But throughout the book, there are these flashbacks where you get glimpses of Anna's past life. And so I'm going to start by taking you to one of those flashbacks. And this is the scene at the airport where Matthias is about to board a plane to leave France, go to the United States, and they're about to start their life there. And Anna will follow him in a couple of weeks. So um, can anybody, everybody hear me? Um, am I clear? Yes, we're all good. All right, here goes. Um, uh, they arrived early. Matthias checked in. They watched his suitcase roll away on the carpet. He would pick it up in the United States. He turned to Anna. Breakfast? Yes, breakfast. Always breakfast. Her favorite meal of the day. Their last meal together until she followed him to America in a few weeks. There had to be a pool somewhere. There was always a pool somewhere. Oh, by the way, in parentheses, a pool is a it's a cafe, it's a chain, a bit like a Starbucks here. I'm, I'm sure there are pools in the United States. So there had to be a pool somewhere. There was always a pool somewhere. They found a pool, she found a table, while he pulled out his last coins. He did not have to ask her what she wanted. A pain au chocolat and one for him. Deux cafés, allongé for her, crème with two sugars for him. They had their last breakfast chip all together in Charles de Gaulle Airport, Terminal 2E. Cream on his lip, his hand on her knee. She kissed both and she finished the crumbs. Now we're in the present. I remember that breakfast, Matthias says, his hand on my knee. Thursday evening, visiting hours. This time we're in my room. I remember that breakfast too just not how it tasted. I watched myself eating, licking, loving that pain au chocolat, like watching myself on film. Anorexia is not present in that memory. I could still eat and enjoy food. I could still recognize the texture of light, flaky pastry on my tongue. I could still savor good chocolate. I can no longer now. That memory tastes bittersweet. Actually, it does not taste like anything. Um, I won't go on. 
I hope you'll read the book. And um, if you do, whether you like it or you hate it, I, I, I hope you let me know. Um, so as you can infer, Anna develops anorexia and the disease takes everything away. You know, her, her taste buds, her the, the fat on her skin, her, she loses her hair, her nails, her relationships. Um, and as she's struggling to understand what's happening to her brain and to her body and where her life went and how to get it back, she and the book explain and take on this disease. And, um, and this is where I, I start talking about anorexia. Anorexia is a disease. Um, it's not a bad habit. It's not a lack of self-control. It's not an excess of self-control. It's not about being thin. No person chooses to have it. Just like no person chooses to have diabetes or cancer. To have anorexia is to lose your ability to concentrate, your body heat, your hair, your period, your personality, your relationships, your dreams, sometimes your life. Anorexia kills more young girls and boys than any other mental illness there is. Anna finds herself in a treatment center with other girls, other diseases and other stories. Not all of them end well, but all have to be told because although they are fictional, the suffering and the courage in them are real. Um, I know this because I lived in a house that's like 17 Swan Street. I know girls like that. I've seen patients like that starve themselves to death. I've seen the people who love them struggle to understand why they're doing this. I've seen husbands shout and fathers cry and mothers beg and say, please, please just have one more bite. So um, I wrote this novel for them. All the, girl, all the girls that I met in a place like 17 Swan Street um, and their families. I wrote it for my family, for my husband, for my parents, for my siblings, for my friends, and for the people who are still fighting diseases like this. Because I think if, if I can write a book about this and if somebody can read it and understand what it's like, whether to have that disease or to love somebody who has that disease, or any other disease, it doesn't have to be anorexia. If I can give somebody some insight or some courage or some hope or just, just make them feel like they're not crazy or they're not the only people facing this, then, then I think that this book would have done something good. So, so this is who I am. This is a bit of background. And um, Olivia, I know that you have questions, so I'll stop babbling now and hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for sharing that excerpt from um, your book um, that I know that was so powerful for me. And I'm sure everyone here was really touched by that. Um, and in your book and when you're reading the chat, you know, some people do describe their bodies in very positive ways, but there are a lot of, you know, teen girls, you know, who don't feel positively about their bodies. Um, and they use words like insecure and, you know, like uncomfortable. So what's your advice to feeling more positive about your body? Wow. Um, oof. What's my advice to feeling more positive about my body? Well, first, don't, don't lie to yourself. Um, I don't fake it. If you're not feeling good, you're not feeling good, you know, um, I'll tell you what has helped me. I, I'm 31 and there are days when I don't feel good. Today is one of those days. Today, I am not feeling good about my body. But my advice to myself and to anybody else is there's a difference between feeling and being. What you feel is one thing, but it's not who you are. I can feel bad, but feelings come and they go. Today, I'll feel bad. Tomorrow, maybe I'll feel good. Hey, maybe after tomorrow, I'll feel super ecstatic and that's that's the amazing thing about feelings um they don't stick to you they come and they go so whatever it is um my advice that at least that's what i do i sit with it i listen to it i identify it i'm not feeling good and then the key word is feel and you find out what it is that sometimes makes you feel better sometimes it's saying out loud, sometimes it's getting a hug from somebody, sometimes it's getting out of the house, doing something else, maybe it's a book, maybe it's a tea, maybe hey, maybe it's a chocolate that you really like that, that makes you feel better. You, 
find out what it is um, that helps you transition to the next feeling because whatever the feeling is, good or bad, there's another one coming after it. So I don't know if that helps. In the, no, the I, yeah, I love that. That's amazing advice. Um, yeah, that's incredible. Um, kind of like uh, in tandem to that, um, how do we help like people that we love or loved ones who are struggling with these feelings? Do you, do you have uh, advice on that? Well, I can, I can tell you the input I've had from the amazing people in my life who have stuck with me through all of this. Um, well, first sit, sit next to me and listen. You know, when, when I'm feeling, just sit on the couch with me, just, just hold my hand. You, don't, don't try to fix it first. Like but before you, before you start, you know, coming up with solutions and hey, cheer up, like, just, just shh, sit down next to me and, and, and listen. I, and then I suppose talk things through, um, tell them, if you, if you love somebody who has an eating disorder or who's struggling with anything, it doesn't have to be an eating disorder like um, anxiety or, or we've all been anxious, like it's been a tough COVID year, or, or, or maybe they're scared or maybe they're tired or maybe they're sad or whatever it is, just listen to them, talk to them, tell them what, what you see. Um, hey Yara, you, you see a crappy blubbery girl I see my friend who's smart and kind and, and be honest, you know, tell them what maybe they're not seeing about themselves. Cause sometimes it helps when, when you give somebody the outside perspective, cause when, when they're in the fishbowl, they don't see it. Yeah, that's, that's very powerful. Thank you so much. Um, and just like a quick note to our audience that I have like a couple more questions and then I will be turning it over to you guys to moderate a Q&A. So if you wanna raise your hand or type questions in the chat, like while I'm asking these remaining questions, feel free to do so. Um, and so as, as obviously we know your book and you kind of talked about this briefly, but your book does shine a light on eating disorders um, and all these different diseases. So how do you hope this sparks conversation like with your family and with like everyone who reads it really? Well, first, I hope, I really hope that, the, for those of you who haven't read the book, there's a lot of science in the book. And it stemmed from when I start, when I, when my anorexia started like really developing, um, I needed to understand what was happening. I'm a nerd, okay? Like I need to know what's going on in my brain. Why is my hair falling out? Where did my period go? Um, why am I always cold? Why is my skin so flaky? Why, um, it, why, why do my knees feel jiggly? Like, like just these, the, these things, um, these medical things. And I would go to articles and I would go to books and, and it, it was always, it was always scientific textbooks and I couldn't find a good book to explain what's going on in my head as a disease um, to my parents, to my friends. And so there's a lot of science in the book, but it's sort of woven into the story what um, the purpose of it is to help the reader get inside the head of somebody who has anorexia um, and really understand what's going on, like sort of like from the inside, like when you, when you have a car and you pop open the hood and you, okay, well, how's this, how does this engine work? If you want to fight a disease, first of all, you, you have to know that it's there and we need to talk about it to know that it's there. B, we need to understand how it works. So, okay, what's going on in this person's head? Why are they not eating? Why are they starving to death? Or why are they eating 10 tubs of ice cream and making themselves sick and puke? Something's wrong with that behavior. So let, let's find out what it is. And then once we know what's going on, um, we can have a conversation about it. And then the last thing I hope that the book does is, is give people hope that, hey, we're not alone in dealing with this. Other people are dealing with this and maybe there is a solution. Maybe there is a light out of the tunnel. So that's what I really hope that this book does. 
I think that's amazing. And obviously we're having this conversation and, you know, we're all learning from you. So, you know, it is a step in the right direction. Um, I'd now like to open it up to audience questions. Um, you can either, you know, submit it to the chat um, or submit it to, uh, you can send it to LibGirl anonymously or you can raise your hand um, and ask it out loud. Um, yeah. And so just sorry, sorry, go ahead, Lara. Oh yeah, if if either you or Olivia could do the moderating because I'm yeah, 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 of course. Jumping on the screen and reading the questions and yeah. So ladies, you can use the raise your hand feature or you can pop your question in the chat. Or if you'd like to ask your question anonymously and confidentially, you can just message um, message the Live Girl and we will ask it on anonymously. So I know that um, you, like you mass, you majored in securities, I think in Georgetown, at Georgetown. And I guess like what inspired you to start writing? I, I'm someone who loves writing and I hope to write. And I guess, how did that come into your life? And um, yeah, that's my question. I love that question. Um, okay, uh, you may have to stop me because once I get started on writing, I just, I don't stop. I've been writing since I was a kid. Um, and my elementary school teacher will attest to that because she kept um, a copy of an essay, like a homework assignment she gave us where it was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote, I want to be a writer. And if I think if you want to be a writer, I think you should be a writer. And the only reason I did security studies and I did the PhD thing was because I grew up being told that that's not a thing. Like you don't nobody becomes a writer. It's like, you're not gonna become a Hollywood actress. Nobody, you're, you're not gonna write a book. Um, it's not a real job. And so I, I did the real job thing and I did the whole setting. And, um, but I've, I've always loved writing and I've always been writing ever since I was a kid. And then I got to a point where I met the most amazing person in my life. He's my best friend and he's my husband now. And he's, he's actually, um, he's, he's, in this zoom meeting right now and and he he said hey you want to be a writer so be a writer and i wrote a novel and i started looking for agents actually no before i wrote a novel um i started a blog that nobody read but my mom and my husband so i had two people reading me now maybe i have five i don't know um <laughs> And I wrote every single week. And my commitment was every single week, I'm going to publish an essay and I'm going to get better and better and better at writing because this is what I love because I wake up every morning and, and I love to write. And if that's what you do, you do it no matter what and you get better at it. So I started the blog and then I wrote a book and then nobody wanted to buy it. <laughs> and then I... Um, I pitched 130 agents until I finally found one agent who said, hey, I like your book. And then my agent tried to sell my book to God knows how many publishers and God knows how many said no, and then no, and then no, and then no, and then no. And then finally one said yes. And I published The Girls at 17th Swan Street. And then I started writing another book. So um, I think it's amazing that you want to be a writer. And I think if, if you want to be a writer, I think you should be a writer. And um, how, yeah. Thank how, you how, so how, much. That was beautiful. Yeah, I know most everyone's like writing isn't a career and that can be scary sometimes, but I loved your story and I'm so happy that you found someone who shares that and was proud of you for doing that. Well, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky, but hey, I'll tell you this, even if I didn't find him and I, I hope you do find one person who thinks that you can do, hey, you know what, I'll be your person. You want to write, write just do it. And yeah, you know what? It is hard. It is very, very hard. And maybe you won't make it. And, and there are days when I sit down and I cry and I think, what on earth am I doing? I should just get a decent job and have someone pay me a paycheck and I can, but Hey, you, you do what you love. You only have one life, you know, and if it's hard, who cares? You, you get to wake up in the morning and do what you love. So do it. I love that. That's amazing. Um, Jordan, you have your hand raised. Do you want to ask your question? 
Um, hi, I'm Jordan. Um, I just want to say that the excerpt, the excerpt that you wrote, um, read at the beginning was beautiful and it, I really want to get this book now. Um, but my question similar to Naya's is how did you come about writing such like so, something so sensitive and something act like something close to you and taking the time to write these words that how, how, like, how do you come up? Like, how do you do it? Like, I, I'm, I'm, I can't, I envy you. And also, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, Thank you. Um, there's really nothing to envy. It's I, I wish I could say like I'm some sort of great genius, but it's like, you know how people process things differently? Yeah. So here's the backstory of this book. I wrote this book when I was in treatment. I was, I was, and people don't like it when I say this, but I was trapped in the treatment center. Okay. I had anorexia and I was stuck there and I was, I felt like my life was ending. And throughout Ever since I was a kid, um, I deal with things by writing. Like this is how I breathe. If I want to cry, I write. If I, I, I need to get it out because I, like all these emotions and all these thoughts in my head, like I can't, I can't deal with things unless I'm writing them. So this book was actually, it was just me pouring out what's happening to me. And then when it all came out, I changed it. I, I changed many things. Like it's, it, it's not it's not actually my story and like that all the characters are fictional, but it started out being, this is what's happening to me. And then I turned it into a story. So it was just, you know, just open your heart out and spill it out onto that page. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you write or you paint or you play the piano or you run or I don't know. Um, what does it for you? Um, I mean, I've been told by so many people and friends, just like journaling and diet, like keeping a diary, but it, I feel like it's so hard for me to like recount the moments of my day. I just, I, I enjoy living each moment and not having to rethink about it unless it was a great moment or unless it was a really sad moment. Maybe I'll want to remember it, but I personally don't, um, enjoy journaling, but I'm trying to find a different type of art form or something that I can express how I really am feeling but I'm still on the search and I'll let you know when I find it well d hey don't do the journaling if it doesn't work for you I mean yeah. like, I, I I can't draw or play sports to save my life like I cannot catch a ball you you and maybe maybe it doesn't have to be art maybe your gift is just being in the moment how gorgeous is that that you're in the moment everybody's always busy 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 rushing and not not noticing how glorious and beautiful the moment is maybe that's your gift I mean who knows <laughs> I like that gift thank you I will take <laughs> it <laughs> that's awesome um so we have a question from the chat um what is some unusual advice you may have for young aspiring writers Unusual? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love how you ask me, like, I know what I'm doing. I have no idea. I mean, I write. Yeah, any, any words of wisdom you can give to us. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll tell you what my words of wisdom are. Um, I did not get an MFA or any sort of crazy, fancy writing degree. I do one thing, I read like crazy. I'm always reading. Like, I think I was born with a book and I, um, you will learn by reading what it, so here's the thing, you cannot create unless you've got, unless you've got beautiful things in your head. And if you want to have beautiful things in your head, you need to fill it with beautiful things. So be very selective about what you're putting in your head. Like read good books, listen to good music, go to museums and just like drink in the, the colors and the art and everything because everything around, like you're absorbed, you're a sponge, everything around you, you're absorbing. If you're surrounded by junk, you're absorbing junk. If you're, um, if you're reading crap, you're going to write crap. So if you want to be a great writer, read great writers. And and not just writers, like watch good movies, um, have good conversations, just absorb everything you can. Because even if you don't realize it, even if you think you're forgetting, everything's, you're, you're a sponge and it will come out beautifully into your writing. 
I love that. I love that so much. That's amazing. That that is a good unusual advice. Um, another question we have is kind of along that train of thought. Which books and authors would you recommend for young female leaders? Leaders. Hmm. Okay. Besides, besides your book, of course. Oh, oh God. I mean, the top of everyone's to be read list. No, no, I, I would not recommend my book. Okay, here we go. Young female leaders. Um, uh, okay, I'll tell you about the... the um, all right, well, I'll start with the cheesy one, but I have to say it. Um, if you've not read Harry Potter, I think Hermione Granger is one of the bravest fictional characters I have ever met. Like, she is... She is one tough, brave little witch who's, she does, she comes from, a, for those of you who don't know Harry Potter, who doesn't, but anyway, um, she does not come from a rich family. She does not come from a wizarding family. She is somebody who comes from nothing and with just determination and a big heart. She is the smartest, greatest wizard at Hogwarts. So. I would read Harry Potter and I would zoom in on Hermione Granger. In terms of writers, um, read Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Read about the March sisters. I adore those girls. I've read that book a gazillion times. It's brilliant. It's, it's just brilliant. It's about four sisters and their mom and they're all very different. So you will find one of them who is exactly like you. Like you you're bound to find one of them who speaks to your heart um, and they're all, they're really smart, brilliant, powerful women in a world that is not friendly to women. So I would definitely read Little Women. Uh, oh, oh gosh, read A Little Princess. If you've not read it, it is not about a fairy tale princess. I mean, the, the title is so misleading. Um, that is, oh God, yeah, that that's, that is, that is the book I would recommend. Read A Little Princess. I think the author is called Fran Francis. Ooh, I need to Google this. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll write those in the chat. Okay, so I said Harry Potter. Sorry. But I really do like that the series. Uh, little Women and A Little Princess. And really, really, A Little Princess is not about princesses uh, and she does not wear pink and there are no tiaras it's it is one hardcore book and it is a brilliant book so yeah I would say read those three those are amazing recommendations and I would definitely add um those to my list um I mean I've, I've read Harry Potter of course but <laughs> um another question it we have we've got is how has um anorexia changed your life whether positively or negatively Oh dear. Um, well, let's start with positively. Um, uh, sorry, negatively. Let's do, let's do. Let's get the bad thing out of the way. Um, it. Um, I have very bad health side effects because of anorexia. I I broke my foot twice last year, because thanks to anorexia, my bones are now like an eighty-year-old woman's. And so I broke my foot the first time in COVID and then it got better and then I broke it again. Um, and that's because I have no calcium in my bones. Um, my hair is a disaster. It looks decent on Zoom, but that's just because I got it blow dried. I lost half my hair. Um, and I won't go into all the side effects of anorexia. I, bad things. My husband, when he goes out on a date with me, he has to call the restaurant in advance to make sure that you know, that they can serve letters for me or that he, he always has to, my husband can't have, he can't share a pizza with me. And he knows that, you know, how some couples, they go out and it's all romantic because, you know, they get the pasta and she has a bite and he has a bite. He can't do that with me. Um, there are a lot of things we can't do and I can't do with my friends because of anorexia. I've lost a lot of friends because of anorexia and I don't blame them. They, they don't wanna hang out with a girl who has anorexia. It, it's, it's difficult being friends with me. Um, my sister and I, uh, she, we used to be the closest to people in the world and now we're not so close anymore. So I lost that with her. Um, my relationship with my mom's very difficult because she, 
she thinks she can fix me and that this is all her fault. Um, I've made my dad cry because sometimes he's just begging me. He's like, well, please, can't you eat that chocolate for me? And I'm like, no, dad, I can't. So anorexia has taken so much from me. Um, I now know that I probably, I have two kids who are two years old and my husband's an excellent snowboarder and I love snowboarding. I probably can't go snowboarding with them. Probably when we do end up going up on the slopes, I'm going to be, you know, watching them waving because I, I can't do that anymore. So um, long, okay, this is a very long answer. Um, I'm cutting off the negative part. Anorexia takes a lot from you. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible disease. And whoever's fighting it, it's really hard. And whoever is around somebody fighting it, it's really hard. Good things about um, that came from anorexia. Well, it made me really know myself very well. It made me, um, I'm very good at knowing how I'm feeling. I'm, it made me more empathetic. It made me it made me see when other people are suffering. I'm, I'm a lot more sensitive to, like I'm very careful about what I say to other people because I know that if, if I make a comment about somebody, I could really hurt that person's feeling. And what I say to you now, and maybe I'll forget it in two minutes, maybe you'll be thinking about that in five years. And so I, it's made me a lot more caring, uh, I hope, <laughs> and a lot, yeah, a lot, a lot more empathetic. Um, it's made me want to get out of my own head and actually help other people. So there you go. Thank you so much. I mean, thank you so much for sharing. That obviously is very deep and very hard to talk about. Um, so thank you so much for giving us that insight. Um, on a more upbeat note, um, obviously, like, um, there is a whole body positivity movement and everything like that. Um, and, you know, social media can be used um, to like in toxic ways, but it's also very much a place where people can uplift each other. Um, so do you have any advice or, or any tips on how young women can change this, you know, body image culture that we have and make it more positive? Um. Do I have, well, I'll be very honest with you. I completely disconnected from social media because it does not bring me joy. I'd rather be with real people or I'd rather be reading a book <laughs> or going on a walk or, um, uh, uh, I don't and know. And it doesn't have to be through social media. It can just be, you know, I guess in any way, really. Well, well, I say, okay, here, I, I do have one. When you think, we have a tendency when, when we think something negative, we say it, but when we think something positive, we just, so maybe sometimes we forget to say it. Like, um, I don't know, Olivia, I love your glasses, or like, just, just say it. Um, maybe if we're more verbal about the positive, we can drown out a lot of, of the negative because the positive's there. It's just sometimes we forget to say it, but if it's quiet, like the other person doesn't know. Like, how, how are you going to know? I think your glasses are awesome unless I say it. So um, if you have social media, use it. Yeah, so sorry. That's the first thing that came to my head. I love that. And that's so true. I mean, we, we need to make it a positive space for everyone. Um, so I think that was all the time we have for questions and now we're going to do some clo closing. Yeah. So Yara, thank you so much. It's such a powerful, thank you for sharing your, the power of your story, um, and sparking this conversation, um, so that we can all make sure that we know that everybody has a seat at the table and now exciting. We're going to raffle a copy of your book of the girls at Ooh. 17 Spawn Street.